morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Optimizing Your Smart Controller. This one is specifically for the Beehive. So we're going to be discussing, if you were in the presentation just previous to this uh, with Jeff Lee about these ratios, it's going to be similar to that. And um, one important note is on the uh, back end of the how these controllers calculate how the water is fairly similar. Um, so the main difference that we're going to be looking at is really concerning the interface and the information that you'll need and how to input that into the controller. You may hear the terms interchanged for the beehive um, as either a hydro rain beehive or an orbit beehive. Um, so beehive is the, their smart version. Um, both of those companies are essentially uh, the same. And so if you see either of those, uh, they're going to look like one of these two most of the time, the, one, the models that are out there right now. Um, and both of them are going to program pretty much the same way. They might have one or two small different features, but for the most part, everything we'll be covering is going to be uh, included for both of these. So again, I'll go briefly over, um, if you saw this already uh, with Jeff's presentation, um, this is going to be uh, very similar. We'll, we'll kind of go through this quickly because it is part of the um, February 6th workshop, which I would recommend you take a look at if you haven't already. Um, so the smart controllers will adjust automatically with the weather. Um, you can find out um, where uh, more about all these details on the smart controllers um, by going to Chandler's workshops uh, website. Okay, so the only thing that these smart controllers are going to do is adjust automatically with the weather. So quickly want to cover some important things that they will not do because it is important to know um, what the limitations are of these smart controllers. If you have broken uh, drip lines or, or missing emitters on poly tubing, the smart controller is not going to know uh, that this is happening and it won't be able to fix this or take care of this or compensate for it. If you have on your lawn issues with stretched sprinkler spacing um, or bad uniformity where your coverage is not very good, um, some of these uh, situations like the two above, the smart controller is not going to be able to compensate for that. So the best thing you can do to make your smart controller beehive uh, work properly or to optimize it for efficiency is to make sure that you um, have the best system that you can in place in your specific yard. If you have any deferred irrigation system maintenance, uh, maybe you uh, inherited a home recently or, or purchased a home recently that um, you're not sure what happened before, then these are some of the things you want to make sure are taken care of before really trying to dial in your settings. If you have clogged um, nozzles or drip emitters, the smart controller is not going to be able to compensate for that. If any of your sprinkler heads are tilted, um, that disrupts how well the sprinklers are covering. Um, again, it won't be able to, the smart controller doesn't know this and it can't really address this. Um, and then if you have any sprinkler heads that are being blocked um, by uh, some lawn, either the sprinkler head is too low, um, then that uh, will also um, impact the effectiveness of your smart controller. If you have poor plant maintenance, if there's a lot of shearing that's gone on, um, this puts a lot of stress on the plants and the smart controllers aren't going to know that the plants are under additional stress other than just what they're receiving from the weather data. So um, if you have a lot of um, excessive shearing, that's something you want to try to address first to make sure the plants are as healthy as they could be so that the smart controller will be optimized. Okay, well, what will the controller do then? Well, smart controllers in general, they're, all, they're going to make daily adjustments to the watering schedule based on the weather. The beehive is going to do this. It's going to be taking into account um, things that are happening daily with the weather and then make adjustments. So the beehive uses um, a type of weather data that's online. So we're gonna take a look at that when we look at the programming um, and it's using a, weather stations that um, are, are nearby, but it is all through online. So it is not on site, it's not on your specific site, unless you have a personal weather station. And it is cloud-based communication. So one thing that's important to note about this type of communication, it's really handy and convenient and easy to set up. However, caution would be, if you don't have internet connection, you don't have weather data. So if you, um, have a situation where you are maybe a seasonal resident and you leave uh, every summer, you want to make sure that your Wi-Fi remains active all year long. Otherwise, the controller will not be able to water properly based on the weather without internet connection. What about rainfall? Um, the best solution in our area typically is going to be a rain sensor uh, because of our summer monsoon rains can be highly variable. The wintertime as well, but mostly the summer 
So um, you can hook up either a wired or wireless rain sensor to the beehive. There's a sensor ports in there um, on the uh, on the controller itself, and that will optimize um, making adjustments for rainfall in terms of making sure it doesn't water when it rains on your actual uh, location of your home. Okay, so what's some of the information we're going to want to have with us before we get started or as we're going through this process? We want to know first what kind of plants do we have? So there's a couple of three different main types, the desert plants or desert trees, and I have a number after it. So that 0.3 is what we would call a landscape coefficient or crop coefficient. Uh, now the beehive uh, will have a default in there. So what we're going to use this number for is just to double check uh, to make sure that the default um, is correct when we're making a programming decision. High water use plants and trees, that there might be something like your hibiscus. Um, if you do have any queen palms left, uh, that would be considered in this category as well. Um, anything that is not a desert plant or tree, uh, but is planted in the ground is, is probably going to be in this category here. And then if you have lawn, uh, depending on whether it's cool season uh, or warm season grass, um, that's going to be your, your numbers that you're going to be looking at, 0.6 to 0.7. So keep this in mind. We're going to reference it again when we go through some programming. The next piece of information that we need is what kind of sprinklers do you have? So the three main types that you're going to see out there um, in most homes, you have a thick spray. Um, so it's going to be the ones that uh, pop up with a single pattern, a rotary spray or, or rotating. Um, this is on a similar sprinkler head, and it has the, the single streams of water that rotate. This puts out the water quite a bit um, slower than a fixed spray, so it's important to know if you, which one you have. And then, of course, drip irrigation. The picture here is a, one of a pressure compensating drip emitter. Uh, if you're in Jeff's class, um, he highlighted this as well. It's important to have drip emitters that are pressure compensating, that are low flow. If you have adjustable or really high flow um, drip emitters that have a stream of water coming out, um, that's going to be much more challenging for us to program and for the controller to optimize the watering. Now, these, uh, this part of our um, yard is going to impact the hours or minutes of runtime. So that's why this piece of information is so important. Now, the beehive, similar to the ratio, is going to ask for what they call an application rate. And we'll go over that in a little more detail when we look at the controller itself. But there is a couple of ways that you're going to want to acquire that information, and you do not want to use the defaults that are programmed into the controller because your controller will not water the right amount of minutes or hours. The next piece of information is what kind of soil do we have? So most areas, um, if you're in Chandling, Queen Creek, uh, you're going to have clay loam. If you're anywhere that's maybe um, on the side of a hill or something like that, you might have it a little bit different, from, or if you're using raised beds, um, that have uh, vegetables in them or pots, that's going to be different. But everything that's planted in the ground for the most part is going to be that one on the right-hand side, that clay soil or clay loam. And what that means is the water goes first sideways when it hits the ground, and then it goes down. So basically, uh, that means we need to soak things very deeply. And how that translates typically to is a lot of minutes or hours of runtime um, that we have to break up into smaller chunks and then give it a break in between for it to soak. The controller would do a lot of this automatically, which is great. So the soil type is important because it affects the cycles, how much, many times it breaks up those minutes or hours, and then how often it decides it needs to water again. The last piece of information is how deep are the plant roots? So these are some ranges. Um, so you can see some of these are pretty far ranges. It might depend on what was happening before in your yard, um, but also um, how mature the plants are. The root depth is going to affect the frequency. So how often is the um, controller deciding to water? Now, if you, when we get to the end, we're going to take a look at our settings. And this would be the first thing we want to adjust if we get to the end of the of programming a couple of zones and we see that something isn't quite right. The first thing that we typically recommend to adjust will be the roots, the root zone, because that's the one thing you can't really see um, is going on. You can kind of take some measurements of lawn sometimes, uh, but it's the one part that we, we're trying to figure out. We're estimating based on um, typical ranges. So this is the one where you want to adjust first before making changes to your other parameters. And then after we're done, 
what we're going to do is check for accuracy of our program that we've selected. And what you want to measure that up against is going to be our landscape watering by the numbers brochure. So if you have a hard copy of this, you can also find it online, but we're going to be referencing this when we're looking at, uh, okay, how often is it going to water? Uh, how deeply is it going to water? We want to reference, double check it with this brochure to make sure that our selections are accurate. And then if they are, then we know we did a good job with programming, everything is set to go. So now I'm going to switch my screen to the beehive. Um, I'm on my iPad here because the beehive, unlike the ratio, does not really give you a good desktop version. So if you have the beehive, I'd recommend using the mobile either on a tablet or on a phone in order to program it because the desktop version does not give you as many options. So now I'm going to go into here to beehive. Okay. Um, Drew, are you seeing uh, the beehive controller on the home screen? Yes, and I was actually just going to jump in real quick. Um, there's a question uh, that came through and it's kind of relevant, so I just wanted to ask sure. it real quick. So the beehive I installed will send me messages that is that it is not connected to Wi-Fi periodically. What should I look for regarding connection? Uh, it is installed outside. That's a good question. So the Beehive, depending on the version you have, some of them only connect to the 2.4 uh, gigahertz network. So if you have a lot of new routers, we'll have a 2.4 and a 5 option. So the older version of the Beehive, I, it, I believe it might only connect with a 2.4. As for why it's falling on and off the network, um, that, that can happen sometimes with the older versions of the Beehive. Um, you could try resetting it on there and seeing if it um, will stay connected. Um, you can also check to see how far your, your beehive is from your router. Um, so if your router is far away from, from where the controller is outside, that could potentially be impacting it as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yes, I, so can, first... I can see your screen. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So what we're going to do first is um, this is your home screen here. Um, and so this is usually when you first open it up, even when you're starting a program, you're going to have something similar. You have all these settings going on. What I'm going to start with here is at the bottom right where it says my beehive. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And then I'm going to click on um, where it says um, devices. So here's the two pictures of ones that, um, that we saw at the beginning. You might have one or the other. We're going to use this one um, for our purposes today. So if you click on this, you can see, okay, it has all the information about the address. The thing that I want to highlight, a couple of things on here um, are where you go down to weather adjustments. So under weather adjustments, I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And if you were watching the Ratio presentation, similar to that, there are some thresholds that you can set. Um, some of the important ones might be your rain delay depth. So right here, if you have it set to respond to rainfall, then you might um, say, okay, then I only want to um, have it, have my controller program be impacted when I get at least this amount of rainfall. So if it's less than this, then the controller is basically going to say it's not enough rainfall for it to be useful. Um, so, and then another piece of information is your, your wind delay. So if you have winds over 50 miles an hour, that's how this one is defaulted to, you can make a decision about that. You might change that to say, you know what, if it's 20 miles an hour, I really don't want my lawn to run. And then the same thing with your freeze temperature here, you can adjust that. Now, in terms of what weather station it's going to select, you can see at the very top up here, it says current weather station, okay, FSV. So I'm gonna click on that and you can see which weather station this one is choosing. And if you wanted to, you can, you can change that and you can say, oh, you know what, I'm gonna use this one instead. Um, because maybe that one's a little bit closer, or maybe that one has a little bit more reliable weather. If you're getting some um, issues with a, a controller where it seems to be watering really crazy, um, and one of these is one of the things you could try adjusting and say, you know, I'm gonna switch to the other station in case one of them started acting really odd. Now, Beehive, uh, the, the orbit on their side, they do a lot of um, uh, checks on weather data, so this, shouldn't really happen very often. They, they try to make sure that the weather data is, is very good, uh, but you could try this if you're having some issues. Um, and you can also see at the bottom of the screen here where it says include personal weather stations, you have this little um, button that you can click. 
So if you want more options than what's available, then you can click on that and make a different selection. I'm going to go back now on the screen. I'm hitting this in the top left. If you can't see, I'm hitting the top left button up there to go back. Um, the other thing that is useful on, on this screen here um, is under smart watering restrictions. So I'm going to click on this. These are some other things that typically you won't have to encounter here at this moment, but um, where you can set certain days and times um, to water or to make sure no matter what, um, things are not watered. You may decide to use this if you have, um, where you say, well, every Friday we have people over um, and we don't want the lawn accidentally coming on, then you could say, um, I don't want anything to water on Friday ever. So for now, we're gonna leave all these in place, uh, but we don't actually have any restrictions that we have to worry about. And then also you could turn on and off your device lights on, and this basically just turns on and off the uh, controller lights that are actually on um, the face of the control. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the actual settings of the zones. So the first thing we wanna do, I clicked on the home button again to get us back to our main screen. Now I'm going to click on this zones button, which is the one just to the right. Okay, so what I'm going to do, you can see there's some zones already in here. We're gonna be focusing on one and two, which is test zone one, test zone two. Um, and what you can do is go ahead and just tap it and that will click it and open it up. And the first thing you're probably going to want to do, once you know what zone this is, is you're going to want to change the name. So for our purposes, we're going to call this our lawn zone. And you can also take a picture of it. You can see that grayed out area. If you click on that, it'll give you an option to take a picture. Another reason why using it on the mobile to start is probably the easiest way. So it's, it's kind of tricky on this screen. You say, okay, where do I click next? That this yellow area right with the smart details, we actually do want to click on this and that's going to take us to where all the settings are. It's not uh, really evident when you first do it, but once you get the hang of it, you'll be, oh yeah, I need to click on smart details. So the first thing at the very top, you can see what it says smart watering and it's a little button, radio button there. We want to click on that to activate it. Um, and that way our zone is going to water using the smart water settings that we're putting in. So now we're going to go through some of these settings here. You can see that some of these are defaulted. Some of them just say unknown. So we're going to go through and see um, what these look like. First thing we'll click on is the soil type. So remember when we talked about what kind of soil do we have, we're going to select clay loam for most areas that is going to be relevant in our area. You can see there's another advanced zone settings down here. For soil, you don't really have to use this, um, but we will use this on some of the other settings. So this is the intake rate. How fast can the soil absorb the water? That's why this is so important of a setting to get correct because if there's a default and one of these other ones, it's going to think the soil is soaking up water faster than it is, or that the soil is draining faster than it is. So there's two options when we're done with this. You can either hit the next button in the top right, or you can hit the back button to take you back to that main screen. What we're gonna do here, what I'll do for us is I'll just hit the back button because that way we can kind of see each setting that we're going through. So the next one down on our list is plant type. I'm gonna click on that. And what we're gonna select for this is we're gonna say, you know what, we have warm turf out there. So we have our summer grass that's coming back. Either we didn't oversee or we're, we're already transitioning back to our Bermuda grass. So you can see there's a couple things down at the bottom here. The one, one option where it says root zone depth. So remember we talked about um, what range is how deep are these roots? I'm gonna click on advanced zone settings here. The default is six inches, typically, you're going to be for a warm season Bermuda grass somewhere between six and 10 inches. So six inches is kind of on the low end. You might want to start with that and see what I'm going to do is go ahead and push that up to seven inches. And we're going to take a look at the settings. And this is something that we can come back and return to as well. So now I'm going to close this screen for advanced zones. And I'm going to go hit the back button in the top left to go back to our main screen. Okay, sprinkler type is our next one on the list. This is a critical piece of information. And the first thing that we, want, we are going to select is, okay, is it a spray or is it a rotor? If you had the rotating nozzles with the single, with the streams of water, you're also gonna select rotor as well. Um, and then if you have drip irrigation. Now, if, uh, what I cautioned in the presentation part is do not use this default application rate. You can see each time I select this, it changes the default. All of those defaults are not typically going to be what you have in your yard because everybody's yard is different 
And the reason is sprinklers are spaced differently. The size of your lawn is different. The design is different. If you use the default, you risk that your controller is going to severely over or underwater your landscape. So we do want to change that. And the way to change that is a couple of options you have on the beehive. The first one that we're going to do is say that we made, um, we figured out, or we already know what our uh, precipitation rate is. If you know that, we're gonna say, you know what? We know that it's about 2.1 inches per hour. If you have no idea what that is, then one way that you can do that is the catch cam cup test. Now in the landscape watering by the numbers brochure, there's a nice page in there that describes how to do a catch cam test. The cool thing about the Beehive is that it actually gives you an option to do it through the app. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on that just so you can see what it looks like. So you get catch cam test was at the bottom. And this is going to describe how it works and what exactly you need to do. Um, I won't spend a ton of time because we don't have as much time in this presentation to go through all the details of it, but I'm going to hit the checkbox in the bottom right. And then it's going to say, okay, run your zones. How many minutes did you run your zone after you put the cans out? And then it's going to ask you, go ahead and fill up your zone, each, each of the cans. So if you put out eight cans, you're going to want to fill up and say, okay, each of these, filled up to a certain amount. And I'll just do a quick example here. We're not gonna use these numbers, but this is an example of what you can do if you really have no idea and you want to make sure that you're getting this accurate, which I would recommend, um, then you can go ahead and do this test. And you can see I'm selecting a bunch of different amounts of water. If you do this test in your yard, you're gonna notice there probably will be some bunch of different amounts in your water, in your cups. And that usually will mean that the system is not covering perfectly, which is pretty normal, but it does impact how well the controller is going to water because it has to compensate for the ones that are not watering as deeply. I'm gonna hit the checkbox on the bottom right just so we can see what it does and look what it did for us. It said it gave us our application rate is 1.43 inches per hour. So that's different than the default, which was 1.73 inches per hour. So this information is very critical because it's going to impact um, how, uh, Number one, how often the controller water, how deeply, but more importantly, it'll, just, it'll impact how many minutes it's going to water, and you want to make sure that that's accurate. This distribution uniformity should really be um, much higher than 31%, because I was just throwing some numbers in there. 31% would mean you really need to redo your system. <laughs> that's too low. So I'm going to hit, instead of hitting done, I'm going to hit this retest button. I'm going to hit retest, and then we're actually just going to hit the back button in the top left, because we don't want to use these numbers we're gonna use the ones that we selected right here, this 2.1 inches per hour. So again, if you don't know this number or don't really have a clue of what exactly um, the uh, precipitation rate might be, I would recommend doing the test. Um, and it's understandable to not know how much water your system is putting out because it's not really stamped on any kind of parts anywhere, um, but it is really critical for this controller to work properly. Okay, so we're gonna hit the back button. And then I'm gonna hit the next one down, which is sun and shade. This one's pretty straightforward. Again, this gives you some options under advanced. If we're growing grass, you're probably gonna have a good amount of sun. So I'm gonna leave this as is, but you can adjust this if you have areas that are receiving um, less hours of sunlight. Um, and that will again, impact how often the controller decides it needs to refill that root zone. Close the advanced settings. I'm going to hit the back button again. This next one down is effective rainfall. We talked about that a little bit already. Um, so I'll skip over that for now for, for time's sake. Now I'm gonna hit the slope button. So the slope, um, again, it's not something that we know, okay, I don't know the grade of slope and percentage on my home. Um, so what you wanna do is for the most part, if you're not sure, you're gonna, unless it's really perfectly flat, typically the recommendation is to select something at least up a little bit higher. And the reason is because what the controller will do is it will cycle those um, zones uh, to maximize the infiltration. So it's gonna break up those minutes or hours into smaller chunks, the steeper the slope that you select. So I'm gonna leave this at seven to 12%, even though eh, maybe if it's not quite that high, but let's see what the controller does and we'll look at the settings. So I'm gonna close this up again, hit the back button. And then this one here, it says sprinkler count. That's, and then the catch cups, those are part of if we do the test. So for now, I'm gonna skip the over those, but if you do, have those cans and you do the test on your lawn, um, then this will give you a, a much more accurate representation of your application rate. So there's the second to last one that says watering schedule adjustments. Before we click on that, I'm gonna go to the very bottom that says advanced details. 
So there's so many numbers in here. This is all the backend information that the Beehive is using to calculate how much the controller needs to run. If you're really into the science and math, you might be interested in some of these settings. It's basically trying to figure out, if you go to the very bottom here, this number, current moisture balance. It's trying to figure out how much water is in the soil. When it gets to a certain number, it's going to start, it's going to trigger the irrigation controller to run again. Now, what we're going to do, there's only a few that we need to worry about on here. So I'm going to hit this edit button in the top right. It's tempting to hit that reset button, but um, hit the edit button in the top right. But again, don't worry if you hit a button on here, you can always go back and redo and undo and a lot of these things. So um, don't worry if you hit a button that you're not sure what it did. You can always do a reset and then kind of re-go through all the settings. So you can see our application rate, because we used the sliding scale, it, it, it took it down really exact. So I'm just going to delete this so it's 2.1 inches per hour. So the application rate is one that we've already selected. The other piece of information that we want to make sure is accurate is this plant factor. When we look at the drip zone, that's going to be really critical. Okay, the next thing, the only other thing on this one that we really want to look at is going to be our root zone depth. So you can see right here it says root zone. We picked seven inches. Again, same thing because we use the sliding scale. It kind of, so I'm going to go ahead and just delete those and say seven inches. Now, um, well, in this case, the default plant factor was good. 0.6 is what we would recommend for warm season grass. So I'm going to hit done, and then I'm going to hit done in the top right. Okay, I'm going to hit the back button here, and now we're going to hit watering schedule adjustments. The cool thing about the beehive is it's going to tell you right off the bat from all the things you just put in what the general expectation is, and then you can get an idea of how well this is going to water based on what we expect. So if we're looking at the months up here in March and April, you can see we're almost into April. It thinks it's going to water about every four days. You see this note here, the chart shows an average number of days between watering. The actual number will, will vary because it's taking daily weather into account. But these are the exact numbers that we want to compare to landscape watering by the numbers brochure. So if you look at the brochure and we look at warm season grass in spring and summer, and you can see May, June, July says every three days. The recommendation, if you look at it, will say every three to six days. So we're right on track. So our interval is really good for warm season grass. Now we want to look at our runtime, our minutes, 19 minutes. For a six spray, you're typically going to be between that 12 to 22 minute range. So this is pretty good as well. Um, and then you can see the cycles, four cycles. So it's going to break up those 20 minutes, divide it by four. So at most, it's going to be only running five minutes a piece before it will take a break. So this is really good. So we can look through this and say, you know what, this is a good schedule. I don't need to make any adjustments to it. Get back. Um, what I want to show you really quickly, what we do will happen if we actually, I'll show you in the drip zone uh, one. So we're done with our lawn zone. So now I'm going to hit the back button again. And the last thing we need to do on this is, is, collect, is select your soil moisture. So I'm going to hit this soil moisture thing down here. And you're basically just going to tell it how much water is in the soil right now or how much we think is in there right now. And that's just is basically telling the controller, do you want it to start watering tomorrow as if it's empty? So then in that case, I'm going to say there's no water. It has been a long time since I watered. Or did you just water yesterday and you installed this? Then you're going to say, okay, it's, it's full. It's wet out there. So I'm going to say don't water right away. It's the back button. So you can see it saved everything in here. It used to have a save these settings. It's really nice now because it's just saving it automatically. Again, make sure that this selection up here where it says smart watering, this yellow uh, little button is selected uh, so that it will use the smart water. Okay, I know I'm kind of pushing it up against the time here. So let's go through a drip zone. This will be a little faster. So I'm going to select zone two, test zone two. Load up. There's a few clicks on the beehive that seem to take a little bit longer. That's one of them. The rest of them are pretty quick. So I'm going to say desert, trees, and shrubs. Okay. Now again, I'm going to say I want to turn on the smart watering, and then we're going to select smart details. Same settings in here, soil type. Let's make sure that it's clay loam. Okay, that's good. Our plant type. See, it's cool turf. We don't want that. We're going to select desert plants. Now, even when you select desert plants, look at that root zone, six inches. That's going to be way too shallow for desert plants and trees. So if you have a mixed zone, let's say it's a zone that has both trees and shrubs on it. So you say, well, we, we kind of have to pick something in the middle. 
usually that's going to end up being somewhere in that maybe 14 inch range. Typically you want to have it deeper, but if you have some mix on there, then we'll start with that and let's see what the controller does. Close that setting. We're going to go back. Select sprinkler type. Again, very important. We're going to select drip. Look at that application rate, one inch per hour. If you were in the ratio presentation, Jeff mentioned if you have pressure compensating drip emitters with two gallon per hour, that's only going to be 0 0.4 inches per hour. That's quite a huge difference. If we left the default, this controller is going to be thinking we're putting all sorts of water down in the soil that's actually not getting in the soil. So it's going to underwater your, even your desert trees and trucks. So we want to make sure that this is correct. Um, the cheat sheet will have more details on how to figure out your drip application rate. So I'm going to close this one. And then we're going to X out of that. And now I'm going to go to um, the sun and shade. You can see it's mostly sunny. We'll go ahead and leave that. The slope, we'll go ahead and make an adjustment here too. So I'm going to take this one up just to the four to six percent. And we're going to hit the back button. And this one, we're not really going to be able to use the catch cans. There is a way to do it on the drip that it's pretty highly complicated. So uh, it's, it's um, typically you're going to kind of go with some rules of thumbs on these. Now I'm going to hit advanced details on here. Same thing. Most of these you won't have to adjust. The one thing you will have to look at on when you're doing trees and shrubs for sure is this plant factor. Remember we said desert trees and shrubs is 0 0.3. That's good. If you selected just the trees or shrubs, this number would be 0 0.6 or 0 0.7, which would be way too high for desert. So in this case, 0 0.3 is good. So we're going to say done. And then everything else, like we talked about, you can leave in here. Um, and uh, now we're going to select our watering schedule adjustments to see what the schedule is. And you can see what some of these are. You can say, okay, wow, it's going to run 153 minutes, um, four cycles. But remember how low flow our drip is. So that's actually really good. The four cycles is nice on the beehive. It's going to break it up um, so that we don't get extra ponding or runoff if our soil is a little bit um, dry and it's not soaking in really quickly. This will help it to soak in much better. And then again, we're going to reference watering by the numbers. So if you're looking at, um, let's look at April, it says every 15 days. I'll take a quick glance over here at my other sheet. If you have desert plants in uh, spring, it says every 14 to 30 days. So we are, we are right on target. Uh, we're on the more conservative end, but that's fine, especially if we've had some excess watering in the past. And then you can see in June and July, every 10 or 11 days, and the recommendation, um, let's see, desert shrubs is every uh, seven to 21 days. So again, we're right on target. Now, if you need to make an adjustment, you can hit this adjust button and you could adjust, you can see these various ones. Typically, the recommendation would be to actually go back into the settings of the zone itself if you're seeing something that's not quite right. So if you say, ah, it's still stretched a little bit far based on how I've watered in the past or the previous homeowner has watered. So what I wanna do is go into plant type and I'm gonna take my root zone down to be a little shallower. So you know what, I'm just gonna say, say it's 11 inches. And I'll show this to you what impact that's gonna have. The nice thing about the beehive is it makes an adjustment right away. Hit the back button, go to watering schedule adjustment, second from the bottom. You can see what it did. Now in June, it's gonna be watering every eight days. You say, okay, I, that's something I'm a little more comfortable with, at least at the start. You can see it decreased the minutes a little bit because it's watering a little more frequently. If you have newer plants or um, plants that you know were watered heavily in the past and you can't quite get them out that far yet, um, then that's uh, something you can do to adjust it. So I would recommend going back into the actual settings rather than doing it on here um, because you're going to be able to keep track of that a lot better. Okay, I'm going to hit the back button here. Again, soil moisture will say, we'll just leave it at zero for now so it waters tomorrow. I'll hit the back button again. So the last thing we need to make sure we do, we've got our zones program, zones one and two, we're all set. Now let's go to programs. Now you can see I'm hitting the program button there on the bottom. Now this screen is very tricky because you look at it and you say, oh, I need to select a program to water, right? So, oh yeah, I have to select A. But it's like, okay, well, why is it asking me all these questions about the days? It's tempting to then fill all this in. We don't actually want to use this. This is if you have a fixed schedule. So I'm gonna say X, I don't wanna use this. What I wanna do is select smart watering. So see the little light bulb in the top right? Select that. And the only thing we really need to tell it is when to start. So it says 7 a.m. It says, okay, well, I have lawn, so I actually wanna start that maybe at 1 a.m. 
Okay. And I'm going to hit save. This is the one screen they still make you hit save. <laughs> Um, and then see how it says smart water all zones. So if that's off, then you can actually pick which zones you want to water on your smart schedule. So initially when you come in here, our, these are the two that we did that we just programmed zones one and two, where it says lawn and desert trees and shrub. So if you come into the screen and those two are off, you need to make sure that they are activated. So you can either do that by saying, okay, I wanna water all zones, or you can select individual ones. If you have uh, flowers or veggies or something and you don't want to use the um, smart watering for those, that's when you could select individual zones to use smart water settings. Otherwise, you would just want to hit smart water all zones and it will activate all of them. In that case, when you go back to your program screen, it doesn't look like anything's watering on the programs and that's because they're all watering via smart. It doesn't need to have a specific day and time or any of that. So just something to keep in mind, as long as your smart watering says on, um, the nice thing about it is if you had them off, I'll show you a quick note that this, the controller will do, it's going to give you a warning at the bottom. You know, it says these zones are never scheduled to water. You'll get that note and you'll be like, okay, something's wrong. I need to, I need to pick how I want these to water. So I'm going to select back all on, and then that will make sure. So Beehive is nice in that way where it will give you a warning if something is about to double water, if you accidentally put it in two programs, or if it's not scheduled to water at all. The last setting, really quick, I'll show you is this calendar. Um, the watering adjustments is, is nice on each individual zone because it gives you a zone by zone view. This will tell you what's happening in your entire yard. Um, so you can click on an individual day and it'll tell you, okay, here are the zones and the times that it's scheduled to water. Um, so some of these, we didn't look at these zone five, but um, you could pick a day and see uh, which zones are scheduled to water on which day. Okay, and I think I have gone over quite enough, so I will go ahead and turn over uh, to questions. Um, this is a little Greek to me, um, so I'm going to ask them, and hopefully you'll understand what he's asking. Um, he says, what is the easy way to determine what version uses the 2.4 MGZ? And then the other one was... Uh, hardware version WT25G2-0001. Okay, it sounds like you're trying to figure out if you're, if it's going to work on the right Wi-Fi. Um, I believe, uh, let me try it on here. If you're still seeing my screen, I'll go under my beehive. Um, let's go to devices, I think is where it is. I'm going to select, um, actually, I'm going to select this other one down below. This is an older version, um, firmware version, hardware, and then you can say update Wi-Fi settings or firmware. I don't know if it says it in the app anywhere. The best recommendation I would have is to look on their website online, um, and then under their under their specifications, they'll usually they'll tell you um, where which Wi-Fi is compatible with. Um, I don't want to hit this update Wi-Fi settings, but that's where you can go ahead and hit that button because uh, I don't want this controller to get disconnected. But you can hit where it says update Wi-Fi settings, the third from the bottom, uh, and try that if you're having issues. Um, this controller is the, is the older model, I believe, so it may uh, have a different requirement. Let's see if this one says any information on it. I don't think it says it on the app um, which one it's compatible with. I'd have to look online, so I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but hopefully that helps to, to answer the question a little bit. Yeah. Hi, this is Drew. So I, um, just to add to what you just said, Andrew, I was informed that the XR is the only one that will do the five gigahertz channel. Um, and I was also, uh, during the presentation, I was trying to do some research. Um, I also found that it says that the Beehive is a dual band device, so it will connect to a network running at either frequency. Um, but like cool. I said, the XR, is the only one that will do the five, I, I guess, so. Okay, that's good to know. That sounds correct from the last time I remember looking into it. Yeah, so if you have an older version, if you have an Orbit or not an XR, um, if you bought yours at, you know, Home Depot or Lowe's or something, it probably is not the XR. So then, yeah, you just need to make sure that it's connected with the 2.4. So if anything, just go into that, that update Wi-Fi settings and reconnect it on your 2.4 gigahertz network. Most new Wi-Fi routers will have both options, so you just pick which one you want it to live on. Cool. All right, and I don't, uh, 
I don't see any other questions. Okay. Um, one other, whoever's still on, I'll give you a quick uh, other last thing here where on the bottom left of your main um, home screen, you can see where it says rain delay. You can select that. This is like a, a traditional controller, but this is really handy, especially if you're not at home or if you're raining and or you see it's raining and you're out and about and you're like, oh my gosh, I think it's still scheduled to water and I don't know if I selected it for rainfall. You can just hit that rain delay and really quick say, you know what, I'm going to set a rain delay on for 12 hours for a day or for a couple of days or more. And then it'll quickly update that and um, give you that sort of peace of mind, if you will, especially if you're not sure what the controller exactly is going to do. So that's a, a cool feature on this, um, besides the fact that it's all Wi-Fi, you can do it from anywhere. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and I just want to quickly add, I was also informed um, about the the catch, the catch can test. Mm -hmm. um, the Beehive catch can test, you have to use their cups. Um, I guess it's because of the size of the openings of the cups and also the inputs are in the mil millimeters. Um, for their measurement. Good point. Yes, I'll go back into that screen here. Um, so yeah, if we decide we want to use catch can cups, um, yeah, it's on the bottom right here, buy now, um, that makes sense. So yeah, thank you for that information. So it looks like if you are, do want to do that, make sure you're getting their catch can cups that will be compatible with the app uh, so that the information is uh, is accurate. and. The nice thing about the Beehive is that watering adjustments pay the watering adjust schedule adjustments. If your number that you calculated, even if you did the test, these numbers look way out of whack, like it's set to water every single day or something like that. Um, or if it's only set to water for two minutes, the catch cans will actually impact your minutes more than anything. So if it's like, oh, it's only going to water two minutes, it's like, that's probably not right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, thanks for that information. That's helpful. Um, yeah, the precipitation rate calculations are, are can be challenging but it's going to really improve uh, how well this controller works. So I still would recommend going ahead and doing that test on a couple areas of your yard. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Oh, I think that might be all the questions. Let's see. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, the, you have to order the, 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 one of the questions was, do you have to order the cups from them? And I, I believe you do. If you go to Orbit's website, I'm sure they sell them there. I'm sure Amazon has, <laughs> has them since they have everything. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you can order them from irrigation supply stores. And, um, yeah, like we looked at here, they have it in, in the actual um, app. It looks like they let you buy it as well oh, okay, um, cool. if you go to the catch can let's see if it loads up here uh, they had a little buy now um, button under there so under smart details oh, okay. and then catch cups you can say buy now and then oh, it'll okay. take you to that so perfect and there it is and amazon <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so yeah that's a good point though to get the the ones and the, so they'll walk you through you can see there's a little youtube button over here on the left here that'll guide you through it so um, if you if you really are at a loss of, of what your application rate might be, um, this is a good test to, to go ahead and do, um, especially if you have a lot of lawn areas in your yard. Um, this is going to be um, really beneficial in the long run for you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew, for an amazing presentation. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending our workshop today. Um, I just want to uh, let everyone know that we do have a short survey about our class. Um, that will pop up once you exit the WebEx. I would really appreciate it if you would just take a minute to complete that so we can use it to improve our classes in the future. Um, but thank you again and hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend.